hello and a very warm welcome to you all. My name's Sean Matthews. You are watching Ren 11. Today is Sunday the 17th of May and you are going to be watching myself and Sarah Dackerman from LA Dismantlers. She'll be joining us in a moment. Hopefully another thing you all have is a beverage. I have actually gone for the same cider as I went for the other day when I was with Busy Moto and that is Devon Mist. It's actually all right. Anyway, without much further ado, we have Sarah just joined us and here we are. Yay! Hello, Sarah. How are you doing? Hi, across the pond. Across the pond, indeed. How's things yeah. over in yeah. wonderful LA? <laughs> LA is wonderful, I have to say. It's beautiful weather. It's Porsche, you know, kind of every day here, regardless of whether we're at stay at home or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, actually. You're, you're fortunate that you can pretty much live and breathe a brand. But I love the crest above your head as well. Thank you. I actually just put it, I took a painting down to put that up. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. You are the CEO of LA Dismantler, um, which yeah. is the one of the world's biggest uh, dismantling companies for Porsche and Porsche only. Am I right? Yes, correct. I am the co-founder and CEO of Los Angeles Dismantler, better known as LA Dismantler. And, and pretty, it is your company uh, now as uh, times have changed. And how does it feel? Because I had um, Lorena Esposito on a few weeks back, as you remember. Yes, and... she's a for me. Oh, she's awesome, man. I love that woman. She's, uh, yes. she's very, very cool. And, and we have a very similar mindset when it comes to certain things. Have you encountered any difficulties being a CEO of this huge business and being female? Okay, well, depending on when you're asking me. So are we talking about when we started 20 something years ago? Or are we talking about now? They're, cause they're in my mind, completely different beasts. Let's talk about that journey then as well. So then we can answer <laughs> that. It's, it's, this is a big question, but I, you know, something, yeah. the, the reason I, I asked this question, especially right now, um, one of the things that I've always admired about my, my, my other half, my, about Victoria, is that she is, when she is in business mode, she is in business mode and she takes no prisoners. And I love the fact how she proves so many people wrong. We're both in the car industry. And, you know, it's something that I've always, I, I think maybe it's, it goes back to my mum because my mum was a very strong willed woman as well, being Lebanese as well in her background. It was uh, mm -hmm. a trying time growing up for her yet she managed to succeed in many things and she did it her own way. And I love that ability to just not give a shit really, but do what you believe is right. You know, people see me as intimidating when I walk in. So that has been one of the beauties of meeting all of the people that I've been amazingly lucky to meet online is that they are mm. not as intimidated because maybe they've had some kind of personal interaction or they've seen me on a chat like this or something where they, they feel like they know me a little better as opposed to just this, you know, six foot blonde coming in the room. So it does kind of change the perspective a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. People have definitely told me that, that I, I look intimidated and I try to always have a giant smile on my face to kind of overcome <laughs> that. Because <laughs> I'm really very approachable. I mean, that's the funny thing is that I'm very personable and, um, you know, it, we all have, you know, we judge the book by the cover whether we want to or not. It's just part of it. So, oh, hugely. Uh, I get that. Mm. So my late husband and I, um, we started our company in our, in our twenties, you know, basically our late twenties. And when I started answering the phone, helping people kind of thought I was the secretary and they thought I didn't know anything. And I'm not going to say I, I was, you know, any kind of expert by that. Definitely. I was just starting out. Um, I'd been a Porsche girl since 10 when my dad had first gotten one and I met my late husband at 20. And so I, my joke is that I sat in a cold garage while he tinkered on his car. So I learned a lot during those years, but I was no expert by any means. And so when they started calling you know, me the secretary and things like that, or the assistant, or get me the boss, they would grate on me you know, a little bit. I tried to let it pass, but at the same time, it's not really what you want to hear when you feel like you, you know, this is, this is my first child and I kind of formed it and founded it and, and so forth. Mm. Um, and then you just eventually kind of get past it and you're like, okay, whatever, you know, you're just a, a narrow-minded person, I'll say. So, um, <laughs> and then that's, that's very politically <laughs> correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not going to claim to be PC at all. So thank God for that. 
was going to. Oh, if I swear, I was. I was going to apologise profusely, but now I, I feel relaxed. That's it. Oh no, no, no. We, we could we could do anything. It's it's you know, IG isn't isn't you know blocking or banning us. <laughs> Not <laughs> yet. Over eighteen channel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that so transitioning. So then during uh, the formative years, kind of in the middle, you know, he was kind of the centerpiece of the company. And I didn't really have to worry about, you know, what people thought necessarily. I was behind the scenes. You know, some people knew about me, but not really. I wasn't very, you know, present in terms of, you know, actively getting out in there. I used to send my teams everywhere to go to the shows and events. So they were kind of the, the scene uh, parties, we'll say. So then jumping forward, so he passed three years ago, actually coming up on Monday, uh, will be the start of his kind of memorial. And um, it was different. So then all of a sudden, I had to put this hat back on. I had stepped back for many years to raise my kids. I have four girls. Mm. And that was an interesting transition. I mean, I, I can't even go into that whole thing. But so then I all of a sudden realized, well, it wasn't really all of a sudden, it was kind of a gradual process. So I was letting my team run it. And then I, I, I thought to myself, you know, I really, I need to get out there. I need to be seen. People need to know who the head of this company is because we're still continuing on. A lot of people wanted to buy the company or, you know, wonder if I was closing the doors and there was rumors and there was this and there's that. And it's, there's a lot of transition when the, when the head of a company leaves. So um, that's when I started to get out and I opened up my social media accounts and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. It was like this flood, like this overwhelm. <laughs> And it was fun, but it was kind of scary at the same time. And I just started adding everybody in, not realizing, oh, these are actually not Porsche people. Like, these are just, you know, fans of a blonde <laughs> on the screen. Ah. <laughs> so, you know, these are all the learning mistakes. I would never been on social media. I'd never done anything except for maybe watch a friend or two. You know, I was completely mm. foreign territory to me. Uh, so then I also had to figure out how to formulate my message and figure out who I am, what I am, what I represent. Even though we had 20 something years of history, do I want to continue forward with all of those things or do I want to create something that is going to start to be more of my idea of how I wanted to run? I mean, he and I were, were pretty uh, compatible in certain ways in terms of our thoughts, but we definitely had different ways of doing things, different ways of thinking, different ways of operating, uh, things that I had wanted to put in place. You know, maybe they didn't happen because I wasn't there physically and I was with my kids. So there was a lot of change and shift. And I think it's just a blessing that it was in this era that it happened. So not only did people, I, you know, I was concerned, you know, here I am, the girl in this male dominated industry. Mm. And it really, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't feel that. I mean, it was just, it was so amazing. And also, so people like Lorena and people like my friend Mar Mariana, who runs, um, she's the president of Porsche Club of LA. So she also was doing something called Accelerating Change with, um, you know, I'm sure people you know. So it was just this kind of blessing that all of these things came in at one point. And it was, you know, we, and then we were all featured on a magazine, automobile magazine featured women in Porsche, um, you know, a whole collection of different people. Some of us are in the business. Some of us are just our owners. And it was, I don't know, it's just, it's been an amazing journey an amazing experience. I've been blessed to meet all these awesome people. So that's a really long <laughs> explanation. It's no, it, you've, you've really had a journey. And, and I, I, the reason I've done this channel, the whole point of actually doing the, the, the IG lives as well is to understand the why. Um, it's like, for instance, uh, to, to give you an idea, I've gone through loss uh, with both my parents over a period of time. It wasn't at the same time, you know, was, at least that's fortunate in some way, but at the same time, you know, every time that I had a loss like that, it was only me, mum and dad. It was just three of us. And the um, the loss spurred me on to want to do better, if that makes sense. And it's interesting because prior to any interview, I always do a lot of research and uh, I do my best to do as much due diligence as possible. And, you know, seeing your journey, it really sparked in me the understanding of, you know, wow, you know, you, you, you were hit with, with what happened and I, I saw the date and it's, uh, it, it's like eight days time, the, the actual anniversary. Um, and, you know, you think to yourself, that's amazing what you are doing, continuing on a legacy and doing it in your particular way. Um, it's, you know, hats off to you, Sarah. Well done. Um, you. And, you know, at the same time, doing that whilst 
running a family you've got two families to run the work family and the home family and you know it's admirable what you're doing and if anyone isn't aware sarah hits social media everywhere uh, I bumped into you on LinkedIn. You know, I was, uh, I saw something. I only use LinkedIn for my personal work stuff when I'm actually doing my, my, my main job. And Porsche, some Porsche UK site said, put all the cars in your driveway or whatever Porsche you have in your driveway. So I fired my 996 up and then you, you liked it. I was like, oh my God, you follow me. You're like, Jesus, <laughs> Sarah, they just mad. Like, How are you? It's so weird. Um, you, you, no one can ever recognize me because I'm wearing a tie. But, you know, obviously. It, ah, yeah. Throwing it all off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly you know it, it, it works uh even though you can't really see it with my, my gandalf beard and and it, i just you know what one thing is you can't you can't fake hard work so what you're doing everything that you do is absolutely incredible mate well done um and, so, all, I, so all those nights are gonna make me all these wrinkles they're paying off is that what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah of course it's, it's stress man it's all good Positive stress. I, I mean, I just, I, I'm up almost, I, I'm, I have a very irregular sleep pattern. And so I'll be answering questions that are coming in at three in the morning and people are around the world and they're like, are you awake? I'm like, of course I'm awake. What else would I be doing? <laughs> well, What's that weird thing called sleep? I don't know that. <laughs> How challenging was it to channel all that energy with what happened to, to moving forward? Oh, well, I'm trying to think of how to answer that. Uh, how there was a lot of things that happened during the, the these past three years. So mm. energy has been gained and lost both. Mm. So I would say that, that death is not the worst part. It's the aftermath. And the yeah. aftermath brings out a lot of things in people that you do expect and that you don't expect and that you're surprised and shocked and aghast. Um, so either you can, you can, and I've had plenty of down moments. I'm not going to try to diminish that. I've definitely had some, some sunken days, but at the same time, you know, I had four kids to feed. No one else was feeding them. No one else was, was bringing a hand out to the door. We didn't have governments during the COVID time saying, hey, you know, here's a little extra. So I had to put my big curl pants on and pony up and get to the table and say, okay, I got to run with this fall. I mean, my, my late husband used to joke with me. He says, yeah, someday I'm going to give you the company. I said, I don't want it. I never wanted to run it on my own. And I know that's a terrible thing to say, but I'm a very bold, blunt person. And I really meant it at the time. Um, there was a time not before long before he passed that he was considering selling the company. And I was like, great, I don't even have to run payroll anymore. That's awesome. And I, I kind of lost it. I, I said, this is my first child when I started. And then mm. I had four kids kind of took that place. But then I realized I need to embrace the entire family. And I've always loved the brand and I've always loved the people, but it, it was getting back with the people that really sparked my interest again, because I'm a networker, I'm a socializer. This whole stay at home thing is great in a sense, and it's you know, I'll keep my call. Cold... <laughs> it's 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 a struggle. You know, I miss <laughs> going out and hanging with people and seeing the cars and you know the connectivity of it. I'm a big hugger, mm, and yeah. that's one thing I wonder. So, I, I, something crossed my my mind not long ago is that when Europe got hit so much, they're into the double cheek method, and I always wondered if that was a bigger transmitter. <laughs> <laughs> US handshake. And I wonder if this is going to completely change our culture forever in terms of are people constantly going to have fears of either the, the side cheek kisses or the handshakes or the I mean, is this going to be the new wave of what's going to happen, whether it's car culture or business or, you know, how does business work with that as well? How does LA Dismantlers work at the moment with that COVID-19? Well, so luckily we are what's called an essential business. So we've been very blessed and fortunate. And Perfect. I told my team, we are so lucky that we picked this industry because, you know, we could have joined the, the ranks of millions and millions of people that are unfortunately not working right now. Um, even though, blessingly, a lot of them have been able to get unemployment. There's a lot of people I know that apply that haven't even been able to get that opportunity. Uh, so we just, I have to say, our office and our team is already somewhat set up for that. Our desks are pretty far apart. We have kind of cubicle spacing. Uh, our counter is not, you know, it's, there, there's a distance between the counter. The guys in the shop are all, you know, running around and kind of doing their own thing. We've got a big open air yard. So it hasn't really been that much of a shift. I mean, so then to the next degree, we've got signs up from the LA County that say that you need to have a mask on when you enter and that you need to be clean and there's, you know, sanitizing products. And every time a customer comes in, we make sure to sanitize the countertops. 
um, mm. all the parts are sitting in boxes for periods of time anyway before they ship. So they're, you know, sanitizing themselves, if you will. Um, there are jokes about how, you know, the, the brake crease might clean it, you know, if the, if it's gonna <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I have to say, besides just putting all those kind of little extra touches on things, it hasn't really changed that much. You know, if somebody has a cold, though, they can't come in at all. So, you know, it, it, there's just these tiny little, little things. And we actually, we, we've been very, very lucky. No one in our team has gotten it. No one from our, our, um, I'll just say small connected portion. So outer skirts, maybe, you know, if you go to the, to the degrees of separation, but no one in my, you know, in, in stream radius, we'll say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, at least that's, that's good. You've, you've made steps and you're able to continue. Um, so well done with that. Let's, let's go back. Let's go back a little bit more. And, and were you a Porsche person prior to meeting Todd? Cause I know you used to, you you embraced car culture from quite a young age, and I understood that you used to maybe perhaps entertain certain street racing. I don't know. I, I merely I merely heard it from other people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, other people! You're talking to other people about me. <laughs> oh, I didn't. I I didn't talk. I just um, I just listen. Yeah, so, I just listen. So yes, my my father because our person his whole he got a washer. So I was so excited because he had a Datsun that had slanted windows and I had to get in there and clean them. So we got the Porsche and it was a slap back and, or a, a hatchback and it was so much easier. I was so excited. And then of course we had a Porsche and it was a tiny little town and we were probably one of the onlys that I ever saw driving it. So that really kind of cemented, I'd say, Porsche in me. And it's funny because I didn't give him credit for a really long time because I wouldn't say I was immersed in the culture then, even though it became an iconic symbol in my household. Um, mm. Then past that, so even as a kid, I, I've talked about this before, I grew up at the, um, my room faced the cul-de-sac, which is a small street that only had a few houses, and I knew every sound of every car that came home without even looking at it. That was just something inbred in me. So then, yeah, jumped to my 20s. Uh, let's see, I'm, I'm going to, so my first car was a brown pony, not very exciting. Then I upgraded to a Nissan NX, if anybody goes, you know, to there. Then I had Ooh. a Nissan Z. Oh, I, I, I upped the bar pretty quickly. Yeah, in terms of my affordability, of course, we're talking about my 20s, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's some so, jump, though. That's good. Yeah. So, and then my Nissan Z, I wrapped it around a tree because I was driving on Sunset Boulevard against a Mustang, and I thought I could take him. <laughs> 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 so I tried to take him after that. So, by then, I had already met Todd, and he would fix my cars for me, and me, and he... Then I had Acuras. I had uh, um, Integras and a whole wide range of, I can't even, I couldn't even recall. Then I had an NSX. Uh, I blew that, the, the condenser out in Santa Monica because we have these streets that are like humps. <laughs> I took mm. it too fast. Imagine. What else? Let's see. But yeah, Poor that fella. was like my Friday night growing up was, was driving Sunset Boulevard, driving, driving Sepulveda, Mulholland. A little bit, but there's not a lot of other people on the road, and I like to I like to be against another person. So sunset was my road. Um, what else? Let's see. Then we then he started building Porsches for me, and I remember that he he you know pulls me over to the shop. And he says, "Yeah, look at this." You know, in this dirty bare shell would come in. <laughs> like, what is that? And then he would torment and everything from the body to the interior, he would customize and put everything in. Although there was always a few bolts rattling around, I will say he wasn't very meticulous. <laughs> he was better at taking them apart than putting them back together. So in the doors, there would be like, <laughs> <laughs> stop and we're like, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> he, he, he believed in making the cars lightweight, clearly. You know, the guy was like Colin Chapman from Lotus, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know what? It was music. We'll just. You know, Porsche radios, as much as I love Porsche, the old one had some static, not always good reception. So, you know, this was my music. <laughs> um, and then you jump past that. And I, I have been really blessed. I mean, he was a car fanatic to the nth degree. So every day, every week, every month, he would be bringing home new cars, whether it was Porsches or whether it was exotics. And it was... You know, he, I was a Bentley girl for years. And so we had Ferraris and McLarens and everything. We had a cup car. We had a, a Carrera GT. Uh, what else did we have? Um, oh, my God. I mean, plenty of GTs and turbos and turbo S's and 
plethora of things that that had come through there. It was it was I was very blessed and lucky. But I have no interest in maintaining all that stuff. Now, so I definitely, you know, <laughs> pulled back my collection. I still have Hummers and all these Porsches that are running around. That's awesome. It's it's great to see that there is a connection as well from from your father um, with you know Porsche as well. But was he from Germany originally, or his family history? Or was he your mum? So he's pretty much full. Yes. Yeah, so his not it was his uh, grand grandfather or great grandfather that, that came from the Stuttgart area. So he at one point took us back in our twenties, my sister and I, and we went to visit the area. Uh, well. I should say this. We all went to Europe. He decided to go down his, you know, historical path. My sister and I went to Amsterdam. <laughs> okay. we, went to, we went to see our path. <laughs> I, 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 I guess a little bit murkier though. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, I was, I was only, I was probably 16 at the time. So I did not actually partake in anything. My sister didn't go that far, but you know, but I definitely, okay. I remember the red light. History. I remember going to, you know, all the bars and, we stayed in hostels, so I met all these people from all around the world. I mean, those were actually incredible experiences. I don't know if you've ever been on a, host a hostel, but, you know, you're basically in one giant room or in, like, a small, you know, room within a group, and, you know, people from Australia and, and all parts of the world and all over Europe, and it's just, you know, as a young kid from America, it's like, wow, like, you know, this is, and everyone's so inclusive. Come back to my country, and you can stay at my house, and... It was it was an incredible experience, I have to say. What makes LA Dismantler, what, what gives it its X factor? Because you don't only export parts to, you know, this, you know nationally in, in the US, you export it globally. Yes. Uh, so what makes the X factor? I don't know if I've ever qualified as that. So, I mean, I'll just the synopsis of what we do is we purchase damaged Porsches. People, you know, Porsches will say that have had their demise and they come to our little slice of Porsche heaven, and they are coming in either, um, typically it's, it's because maybe someone needs an engine or needs a body, or we just thought it was a, you know, a good car to purchase. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have pre-existing orders that are already going to be filled immediately, and we're starting to drop engines and transmissions and break them apart. Sometimes they are going to wait until you know, a builder comes along. So it's everywhere from a standard person that needs just a very simple part. Maybe you got into a front end fender bender, all the way up into Outlaws and Builders, Bizimoto. So you said you were on with him the other day. And his, I don't know if you told you, but the history of him getting into Porsche was because he connected with my late husband. He said no one supported his project. And he and Todd had this connection. And he built his por first Porsche from us. And so, you know, I, I love them. He, he and his wife, are, are they're amazing people. Um, so people like that have been, been really inspired. I mean, I, I give parts to uh, Rod Emery for his build. Actually, and back to Busy, his 935, he's, there's a little sticker of us on there because um, we, we worked with him and we gave him some parts for that car. Um, so Rod Emery is, is not very far from us. So he builds 356s. And even mm. though I don't work 356 parts because I don't break them apart, but he puts 964 parts inside. Next door to me is Singer, and I, you know, Singer, I get takeoffs from them, and I also supply them with parts for their cars. Um, you know, Lorena, Lorena's company has been a client for a really long time, so her father and I, you know, our company has gone back for, I can't tell you how long. Um, so, yeah, so this happens all over the world, everywhere from, you know, Asia to, as I said, Australia to, you know, the, all over Europe and South America. Um, we have groups that come in to visit sometimes, especially around the big shows in Los Angeles. So whether it's SEMA or whether it's our, our Porsche week that we just had a couple months ago, um, people will fly in and they'll come in and big groups. We'll have like a big Brazilian group one time or, you know, Germany, obviously we have Germany all the time. And it's funny because after doing it for 20 something years, you know, sometimes I walk in and it's almost like I have blinders on and <laughs> I, I almost forget not what I do, but it's like new cars arrive and it's just it's like, okay, it's another car. We got, you know, assignments and we got to part it out. We got to do tasks to do. And I don't really, I, I don't really see it the same as others do. So we have people that fly in from all over the world and they're just aghast and blown away. And some people are really sad about it. It's a very emotional thing if you kind of connect with it that way. You know, somebody either, obviously they had an accident. Some people could have lost their lives, sadly. So if you really start to spin it in that direction, you can get very emotional about it. And I had to shut off that gene a long time ago. So I look at it the other way. And I think of how many Porsches can we save out of these cars? 
So that's why my motto is keeping focus on the road, because that's really what our agenda and our initiative is, is how can we make sure that we're getting the horses out there, you know, to be roadworthy, even though they originally had something that brought them to our facility. I hear you. God, that's, it's great that, firstly, you work closely with so many businesses. Now, Busy mentioned, oh, when you came on, because you started watching the, uh, the live video, and as soon as you came on, Busy was just like, oh, hi, Sarah. You know, you know how Busy is. That guy is just... A, a, he's a everywhere. Ball of he's so he is. He is. So I, informed. I mean, have you, seen, have you seen his tech talks live? Yes. He can talk about any car, any make, any model. He did one from my from my shop. I was like, I didn't. I couldn't even get it worded edgewise because he his, his <laughs> he's crazy. I, I love his knowledge. Like I, I I call myself a sponge. I'm like a Porsche sponge. I love to soak up information from other people. Yes. Yeah, I hear you. And, and he's a great person to learn from because he explains things very simply. You know, a, a, a decent engineer will be able to explain something that comes across quite complicated in a very simple way that doesn't alienate anyone as very people friendly. And that's him. That's him to a T. The rare bird. It is a very rare bird. But then that just shows his excellence in what he does. Right. And busy. I, I think someone just mentioned you also assist Roof. Yes. So Roof has, has been a, a client for I can't even tell you how long. And, and a lot of his bills have come from things that, that he'd gotten through us. That's incredible. Yeah. That is absolutely he's, I mean, incredible. Builders and yeah, he's, he's a really nice man. Does that. He's, he's, he's going on so many different directions right now. Like Gumbala, you know, Gumbala was uh, worked with him. They, they're doing some crazy projects right now. Yeah, gosh, they've always been doing crazy projects. Their cars are mental, but but a cool mental, you know. So, you know, what do you think makes them? I, mean, I know there's proximity in some of it, but what do you think makes them want to work with you? And then you have a lot of people that support you. I mean, I've got a list here of your what was it uh, associations. So you've got Renlist, Porsche Owner Club. Uh, Porsche Club of America, Porsche Club of America, Santa Barbara region, and PCLA Los Angeles, um, you know, to, to name a few. So, Can why? I tell you how that list is, too? That's funny. I, I, I really need to update so many things on my website. So, uh, yes, yeah, so PCA have been, you know, contributing part of volunteering for probably since I started the company. So let's say 20-something years. Mm. Uh, I was Santa Barbara region for a long time, and then I transitioned to L.A. because L.A. didn't used to be as big of a community. And now we're fifth the largest in the nation, and it's incredible, and it's been a, it was a huge turnaround. Uh, so I sit on the board there, so I'm very active in the L.A. PCA. I also go to all the PCA national events that they put on, which are the work reunions and the parade, although half are canceled right now. Um, what else? I just became an ambassador for uh, Gentleman's Driving. So that's going to be something that's going to be formulating. It's out of Spain. It's going to be growing exponentially. Um, I'm cool. also an ambassador for Roadster. If that, uh, it's, a, it's a driving app. Yeah, yeah. For I know Roadster. Uh, what else? I'm trying to think of. Um, I'm also part of something called Hidden Pioneers, which is a group that is trying to make change in uh, automotive, well, transportation. I shouldn't say automotive. It's really transportation. My part of it is, is the automotive sector, obviously. Um, and that's because there is a real lack of technicians and mechanics that are going to be coming through. So there's already a lack now, but because they've taken a lot of the funding out of the schools and the educational system, there's no shops anymore. There's no way for paid people to play and practice. Mm. Unless you go to a training school, that is going to be carrying forward, and there's going to be a severe lack of, of technicians coming within the future. So getting that bug planted in these educational things takes a long time and, you know, but I'm hoping it, it, it'll be transformative at one point because not everybody's designed to go to Harvard. You know what I mean? Not everybody has the ability. Yeah, no, you know. <laughs> but, it, but that's not, that's not, it's, this is, this is an interesting thing. You're right. Uh, but it's not a sense of being not good at something. It's finding out what you excel at other things and people that may struggle with, um, you know, an edu like a regular education where you're working from a book and writing on paper may flourish in something that's more physical, may flourish being in front of people, may flourish doing something uh, away from the school curriculum. I, I'm, I'm, I work in learning and development. And one of the things that I've always f believed in, um, especially working in, in, in that field is, you know, you have two different animals. Let's say you've got a, a, a chimpanzee on one side and you've got a goldfish. 
if you tell both of um to the the test is to climb a vine let's say um the chimpanzee is gonna flourish at that the goldfish is probably gonna fail um and that's the education system to a t you know you're asking some people to do something that is a real challenge and struggle for them and they just won't excel but that doesn't take away from what they're good at because the chimpanzee probably couldn't fast as quick uh, uh, swim as quick as the um as the goldfish for us for instance you know changing the tack or changing the test for each individual person is the only way to do it but you can't do that in an education system where you've got so many different kids in there it, it's a challenge people only learn outside of the education system and having this opportunity if they can be hands-on to work with cars work with their hands or do something it's great benefit for all of us taking our cars to these people but even better it gives them something to work towards so it's it's an amazing thing that you're doing that's brilliant well it's also like you so you're talking about working with your hands it's a kinesthetic skill so I'm definitely mm. a visual learner. I need to see. If someone's audio thing or trying, it's challenging for me. My brain starts spinning. I need to read things. Like, that is how I learn. I'm a texter, corporate that way. My late husband was not educated at all. He came from a, a, a family of cars, and that was drilled in his brain. He never had summer vacations. They didn't understand that. It was work, work, work was the total ethic. Um, he got a GED, and he was a brilliant man, and he acquired knowledge in a tremendous way, I don't even know how sometimes we could talk about any subject. It was incredible. Um, educated. So I've got a dad who's a lawyer. My mom's got a master's. My sister's a doctor. I mean, that was drilled in me. You get an education. So I got my degree from Pepperdine. I, I went into business. Um, but everybody works differently. And it also took me, gosh, it took me over 10 years, you know, to actually to finish. And I'm sure they gave up on me, you know, in terms of completing my education. But I did what I needed to do during those times. So I dabbled and then I worked and I dabbled and then I got serious about it. So mm. that was, that's that you have to embrace education when it's important to you and when it's relevant to, you know, what your needs are. I remember my yes. brother-in-law said to me once a long time ago, I had gone to visit my, my brother and my, my brother-in-law, and my sister in San Francisco. And he was, you know, he was a, a broker for Wells Fargo, very successful. Um, did international uh, banking and so forth. And he said, you know, at some point you're going to be limiting your income. And he talked about what those kind of measures were. And I never really thought about it because I was making pretty good money at what I was doing, you know, hmm. and it just, it didn't even dawn. And not that income should be the complete, um, I'll say, reason for what you're going to do, educating yourself or working or something, because income is only one generator or qualification of success. I don't necessarily believe it's all income driven. No. But it can provide access to things. And so whether it's experiences or vehicles or whatever it is that you want, you need income in order to have that. But it doesn't ever guarantee happiness, I will say that. I mean, you can have a very, very wealthy person that's very miserable inside because they have chosen to channel out all the people around them because they were so focused on just work and not incorporating the people into their life. You know, and then you can have a monk who's in, you know, some monastery somewhere and they're beautiful because all they've done is just relieve everything out of life and, and there's no stresses and there's no worries and there's, you know, it, they just live a, a life of solitude and, and surviving and, you know, there, there's, there's got to be happy medium somewhere for everybody, obviously, in the middle. Yeah, hopefully one day we'll find that as humans. So uh, I look forward to finding that myself. And we're all, um, we all have a different path to get there. Hell yeah. That's the fun part. Um, going backwards then, so those brands that we talked about before we went off, and again, another magpie star tangent, um, you know, <laughs> what do you think makes, what, apart from, yeah, there is that part of, well, we've got the parts, but what makes them come back for more? What is it that you guys do? You should ask me a question. <laughs> yeah. I never did answer that. No, no. Okay, so <laughs> there's, okay, so there's a couple things. Um, I, I do have to, I have to tread lightly. So I, I can't divulge, obviously, why certain people buy from uh, me or, or so forth. But I'll just I'll say generally. So first of all, it's access to things. Uh, the L.A. area and even just the entire United States has cars that, that are not seen in other places because we're such a large importer. Um, there have been transitions over the years of whether cars have left the United States and gone out to Europe and then sometimes they've come back and you know so forth um there's also exchange rates exchange rates are, are a, a major factor when you're talking mm, about a, a big course. difference in change. 
So sometimes it's, you know, more or less expensive, depending on how the markets are driving to buy in the US versus buying in Europe, even though you're counting the transportation fee and, you know, the cost to import and so forth. Um, and then it's relationships, I'd say. So I'd say those are probably the three factors. So it's, it's access to supply, probably the currency, and then also relationships that you build. And so the longer that you formalize a relationship and work with somebody, and the more that they, that they purchase and buy, the better pricing they're going to get if you're going to go back to a price-driven economy. It really depends. Everybody, not everybody works on the same formulation. So some people are going to work with somebody, even though maybe their prices are more expensive, but they trust and rely that they're going to get what they want or they need, and they're not going to scam. I mean, in 20-something years, I can't tell you how many things that we posted online. Let's say I put a turbo engine up for sale. That picture can be taken and posted anywhere. And so people have been, have, you know, they, they somewhere, I, I, I'm thinking of the UK. So there was, there was a, an engine that was posted. It was our picture and it was posted in the UK. Somebody sent a wire and they bought it because the guy put it up for half price. And he calls us and he says, where's my engine? I, said, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, there are scam artists all over the world and they are very happy to take advantage of people that are not willing to, like you said, do diligence. Of course. You have to be very careful. I mean, I've worked with vendors in this industry for many, many years. And there are some that I know that absolutely their word is gold. And there's some others that I have to go, okay, I'm hoping this is gonna work out. And there's others I go, you know what? You burned me once and I can't work with you again. And I'm so sorry, but I have to kind of cut that bridge. And I would never repeat names of that, but it's just kind of a standard. I mean, the automotive business is known for, in one sense to be this amazing thing. And in another sense, there are some, you know, dirty players and characters. And I, I won't operate in that field. That is not something I would ever tamper with. No, and that's, that's that, well, it, it tarnishes you if you were to operate in a negative way, even you were dealt with negatively, you know, it's almost like a, a karma thing, if that makes sense. But also, professionally, it just doesn't work. You know, you can't badmouth them, you can't say anything, and you can't work with anything like that. I get that. That's very, very true. Um, something... and, and I've gotten my share of good press and bad press. I mean, I, you know, coming back out and being on social media and being very present, opens up a lot of things. So people have delved into my past and I'm not going to say I have a, a you know, it's everybody has, has, you know, baggage coming behind them because I'm 46 years old and things have happened in my life. And I just, I really choose to put my energy towards the people that are willing to support me and be positive and create those kind of relationships that I am worried about, you know, the guys who could say something because I'm a girl or because they think I don't have any, any knowledge or they think that I just took over because my husband passed and I didn't, no, I, I actually have a 20 something year history. I may not have, I may have stepped out of the, of the boat for a little while, but I definitely know how to run the ship. Do you, do you still feel that you have, that people base their assumptions on what they see with you from the past or what they see on the internet rather than when they interact with you? Um, you know, That's... I can't speak for people. I'm gonna, yeah. I, I definitely know that I've shifted a lot of people's thinking about who I am, what my company is, um, what we represent. Mm. And there, there's definitely some people, you know, listen, I'm a used parts seller. Mm. Every car that comes in is, is a, um, a, I wanna say a wishful thinking to think of every, part that comes on it is perfect so we take a car and we take all the parts apart and we take put them on the shelf i can't test every single item before i send it out have we ever sent out you know parts that are not working before it happens this is part of the used car business you don't always know the retroactive effects when a car crashes of what is going to be you know the, the i'll say the, the uh domino effects of course so somebody that 10 years ago and this happened not too long ago bought something and saw me somewhere and posted something negative about it. And so I researched and I, and I was like, that was a 10 year old transaction. Like, I'm sorry if that happened. It doesn't mean that that's commonplace, you know? So I can, do I worry about changing the one-sided people, the narrow-minded people, you know, that have had some kind of experience? No. Can I also know that out of that one guy, we've had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions that were so smooth and successful and people are so grateful whether it's, you know, race support, getting things to the, to the track before their car's going to, you know, go out. It's, you can't worry about those. The little no. Things there. no, you can't. But, you know, and, and that's the thing. You can't please everyone. And sometimes, you know, just in the way of the business that we, we find ourselves in, cars, are they reliable? No. Do parts give way? Yes. Do, do some things, things just happen. You can't control it. What you do, and I suppose 
you know, that comes from customer service or great customer service is, is how you move forward with that if you can, you know, if there's an opportunity to. And that's how you build that relationship. Like you say, the relationships are very important. Well, it's all about what you do after the situation happens. Mm. So trying to, I will say other things too. So the, the ability to be able to, to make, a, you know, a difference in changing it and, and be able to get the correct part out to the person or, you know, provide them the money back, whatever it is. That's an obvious, you know, must in any, in any mm. company. But I will say over all the years, I definitely recognize that people are less than fruitful with their, you know, opinions. We've had people that have shipped a box of parts back, I'll say parts, because there was rocks in the box. <laughs> and they weighed exactly the same weight. So they just, you know, there are scam artists out there. We've had um, seller, I'll just call them again, sellers that have said that the parts were not working because they wanted to sell their own parts, you know, because they're going to make a higher profit on it because the client is bringing, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. But again, is that the majority of people? Obviously not. And so you just, you start to learn who is and who is not trustworthy along the way, whether it's suppliers or whether it's clients, you know, you just got to weed them out. No, it's true. It's true. You run a business at the end of the day. The business has been around for over 20 years, um, 22 plus years, almost 23. Is that right? Or more? I'm trying to think of when we actually started. It was, I graduated in 2002. So probably around, I mean, he'd already been doing it even before I came around. He'd been doing it since, you know, in my, my early 20s. But when we formalized the business, I'd say mid 20s. And then it was kind of a slow roll because he was working out of another yard and it was kind of a hobby that he did on the side. But then in 2002 was really when we kind of, you know, put our boots to the ground and said, no, let's do this. We're going to get our own building and we're going to really make a run for it. So it was, it was, you know, a pitter patter, you know, before that. And that's the thing with that kind of lifespan you've had and may it long continue um, sincerely, you're bound to have those few naysayers that are going to start something. And it's a bit like the, uh, like you say, the domino effect. Um, you know, you have one person and if they're loud enough and brash enough that another may be narrow minded or someone who's not willing to look for themselves and do their own due diligence will will hatch onto that. And that's where it passes. But then, look, we have people here and I've seen some amazingly positive feedback, even on the chat uh, during this conversation. So something yeah, I like even, I can't even wash it. That's my ADD brain. I'm like, I have to. <laughs> yeah, same here. I'm literally going through everything at the same time. Who said men can't multitask? God damn it. Look at me. I mean, I'm struggling to breathe and talk at the same time, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, so Speedster, you know, Sarah, we all know that you and your team are honourable. There was someone above as well. There was a few people I was, above. I was playing with, with uh, Lake and Amelia. We had so much fun. That was the best, best, best thing that could have happened in 2020 was Amelia Island Concours. Oh. And it was right before this all came to a head. And we flew back. Like, I remember I had a cold the weekend before. So we just had finished Porsche Week here, which is the lit show. And there's a Phoenix Club swapping. And everybody's having open houses. And it's so much fun. And then it rolled right into a couple days later, Amelia. And in the, in the middle, I had gotten a cold. And I, no, I wasn't even a cold, I shouldn't say. My whole, my whole family was vomiting. And I flipped out going, oh, my gosh. What if <laughs> everybody, because you got to realize that in LA Porsche Week, it's all, it's a 356 registry that's running it. So the age of this common population is, you know, COVID central, we'll say. And I really flipped out thinking, oh, my gosh, what if I transferred anything? And then I started thinking, what if I can't make my flight and go to Amelia and I'm a vendor there? Blah, blah. Thank God it all worked out. It was less than 24 hours. It was gone. And I was so grateful that, you know, no bad effect had happened. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, I, I um, it was it was Amelia was a great, great event. If no one's been I didn't even know that it was that big. So, Pebbles next to us, and that's been a synonymous name for contours. Of course. But Amelia is incredible, and it's out in Florida, and except for the mosquitoes, I'm not a fan of them. It's Everybody should try it. Uh, I was in Florida. I came, went to America for the first time this year. The reason for it was Das Ren Treffen uh, down in Miami. I missed it. Next year. Uh, next year. I'll meet you there, and we'll, we'll, we'll grab a – we'll actually grab a proper one together, mate. Yeah, uh, you'll be able to meet Vix as well. So, uh, <laughs> awesome. But, but this is – you know – I wanted to go to Amelia Island, but I don't think I could have got an, a, a month off work for in between, although I would have happily stayed in America. I'm just putting it out there. We've got a few questions from other people to answer, and you have okay. approximately four minutes. <laughs> okay. okay, the I'll first my... question is oh, from... Actually, really, really quick, I see Taste of Motorsports. They have an event coming up 
he can type it in because I forget exactly what the date is. But yes, if, if it's on the twentieth. No, in August. August it is. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. He he tagged me in okay. something today. Bless him. So uh, I I shared it. But uh, I'm still waiting for him to send me the the official invite where he's going to fly me in and stuff. And yeah, we'll be down for that. I'm joking. Don't worry. I'm, I, I'll pay for my own flight. It's all I'm like, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know. Uh, um, bear with me one second. The first question we got is from Casper, and he's from the Netherlands. And no, it's not a question about he doesn't believe you that you didn't have any marijuana when you were there. But he did say, uh, how many 996s come in with engine IMS failure? Do you think the problems are exaggerated by the internet or not? Okay, so we could talk for an hour about 996s and IMS failures. <laughs> <sighs> I like my uh, car. I don't think I, I don't want to say anything say, hurtful when I'm inside him. Oh, that's kind of dodgy. Say that I, I think it's somewhat of a misnomer to think that every 996 is going to have an IMS failure. Definitely. Mm. And there's been many, many articles to prove it, as well as there have been many, many articles talking about how every 996 is going to have a dismount. Once you get, oh, so first of all, there was, I, I won't even get into all the technical aspects because it has to do with when they manufactured it and how the ports were and blah, blah, blah. So again, people can go and research the technical details of it, but um, there are definitely certain versions of it that are never going to have a problem. There are also certain versions of it, depending on how you were caring for it, are not going to have a problem. So the, the, some of the science to look for is you're going to start to hear knocking in your engine. You're going to start to see smoke coming out of your exhaust. You do want to look for that. And it's sometimes around the 50,000 mile mark Usually, if you get way past that, you're going to be fine. Mm. I also do know that I think shops, wink, wink, might have taken advantage of the situation. I think maybe some places decided that they wanted to say every nine and six has to be rebuilt, and you know, and then Porsche made a fix too. So there are actually things you can put in the engine that will fix it. Besides the fact that Porsche took care of a lot of them on their own already, but they've manufactured some things that are definitely helpful. Mm. And a lot of people agree with you, and you know I agree with you as well. Uh, although I did change my IMS because it, um, I had to have a clutch changed, and there were some other things that were discovered within the engine just before it went. So I'm happy with that. Okay. Sometimes it's better to be safe than sorry. Not opposed to that. Yeah, I agree. You know, but uh, I spent a lot of money on this car already, and it's not good. <laughs> but that, that's Porsche life, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. Could you answer this next question in approximately 30 seconds, do you think? Uh, this is my challenge to you, Sarah. Okay. When's a Porsche not a Porsche? How far from original is not original? That's from Jerry Akari. Okay. So there are definitely my, – my, my late husband was an OEM fanatic. He every car to be down to stock to the wheels. Mm -hmm. I am uh, embracing the opposite, again, because we have so many outlaws and we're in this era of builders i love and support my opinion if it started as a porsche it would always carry be to, carry through to be a porsche someone that i was speaking to the other day that says you know once you customize it so much why put the porsche logo on it because really it's not a porsche that's not what they envisioned or engraved there's such a wide difference of some people love rwb some people go oh my god that's a monstrosity so <laughs> i don't know why i appreciate beauty i appreciate identity i like when people um put their little spin on it so if you have two stock cars next to each other to me, it's like, which one's mine and which yours? You know what I mean? I at least have some kind of differentiation to say, this is my individual. Even if it's only changing one thing, just so that you are of just a slightly different, you know, different look than, than everybody else. I completely agree as well. That's an admirable answer. You did that. We'll call it 47 seconds, but very well done. Uh, <laughs> Sarah, I want to say thank you so, so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. You've been absolutely wonderful and you're an absolute ray of positivity so just keep doing what you do um...